Welcome back everyone. Today, I'm going to recap a 2009 action thriller film called, Law Abiding Citizen. Major spoilers ahead. Clyde Shelton, a Philadelphia engineer, is enjoying a night at home with his wife and daughter, when two intruders suddenly barge in through his front door, armed with a baseball bat. They knock him to the ground and tie him up. One of the men, Clarence Darby, pulls out a pocket knife and stabs Clyde. As his wife comes out to the commotion, Clarence attacks her, while his accomplice, Rupert Ames, loots the home. Clyde is then forced to watch the rape and murder of his wife at the hands of Darby, who then carries Clyde's daughter away as he slips out of consciousness due to the blood loss. Clyde survives the attack, and is left emotionally scarred. We find that his wife and daughter had both unfortunately been killed that night. Both men have also been apprehended. Initially, he has a lot of faith in the law and the justice system, and believes that his family will be avenged. But his hope is frustratingly cursed as he is told by career-minded prosecutor Nick Rice that the case was compromised by a bungled forensic investigation and Shelton's testimony cannot incriminate either man because he was unconscious during the incident. Rice, interested in maintaining his 96% conviction rate, makes a secret deal with Darby, in return for pleading guilty to third-degree murder, he will provide testimony that will send Ames to death row for what is, essentially, a robbery charge. Shelton is left feeling betrayed, believing the prosecutor was more interested in his reputation, and also knowing that it was Darby who had committed those heinous crimes, yet he will be set free. In his eyes, the justice system had failed him. Ten years later, Ames is being executed via lethal injection, but something goes wrong. Instead of a painless, quick death, he suffers agonizing pain before finally dying while going through shock. Someone had tampered or rather switched the chemical that was ultimately used in the lethal injection. Authorities conduct an investigation and initial evidence leads to Darby, who is alerted to approaching police by a mysterious caller who tells him where a pistol he can use to his advantages, which he had hidden for him to find. The caller tells him if he wants to escape the police, he must come to where he is. After meeting the mysterious caller, who appears to be a police officer, Darby reluctantly enters the vehicle, knowing it's his only chance at escape. The officer drives Darby to a remote area where an old warehouse is situated. When Darby gets out the car, the officer reveals that he is the reason the police are after him, and then he removes his disguise, revealing that he is Clyde Shelton. Darby tries to shoot him with a pistol, only to discover it is a trick gun, which, upon pulling the trigger, protrudes poison lace spikes out of the handle injecting him with tetrodotoxin, paralyzing him, but leaving him fully conscious and able to feel pain. After restraining him and making preparations to ensure his prolonged awareness, Shelton begins to film Darby on a makeshift operating table. Shelton slowly tortures and dismembers Darby, saying the words Darby told him 10 years before, you can't fight fate. A videotape is then mailed to prosecutor Nick Rice's home. His daughter excitedly picks it up, and begins to play it, believing it's a tape of her school play rehearsal. To her horror, what plays on TV is the dismembering of Darby's body. Investigators track down the warehouse and find Darby in 25 pieces, and after an investigation reveals that the warehouse was linked to Shelton's name, Rice and his team suspect Shelton, and a police unit is dispatched. The next day, a local SWAT unit bursts into Shelton's house to find him waiting for them, and he doesn't resist arrest. In an interrogation cell at the jail, Rice covertly congratulates him for removing Darby from society, then asks for a confession. By all appearances cooperative, Shelton offers a full confession in exchange for a deluxe mattress in his cell, Rice reluctantly agrees. At his hearing, Shelton opposes a motion to deny himself bail, citing obscure legal precedents. Judge Laura Birch, who also presided at Ames' trial, agrees, but Shelton launches into a tirade against the court's preference for legal technicalities over justice, as that was the reason Darby had gotten away with the murder of his wife and daughter. He is removed for contempt of court. After receiving his mattress and delivering the confession, in which he confesses not only to killing Darby but also to having altered the lethal injection chemical that made Ames' death agonizing, Shelton bargains to give the location of Bill Reynolds, Darby's attorney, who was reported missing three days before, in return for an expensive steak dinner from Del Frisco's to be delivered at precisely 1 p.m., along with his iPod. Warden Inger demands multiple precautions, resulting in the food arriving at Shelton's cell eight minutes late. When they finally get the address from Shelton, Rice and Detective Dunnigan find Reynolds buried alive and only minutes dead, with Inger's delay causing him to suffocate, his oxygen tank having been set to shut down at 1.15. Dunnigan explains that because Shelton received his lunch at 1.08, they were seven minutes late instead of getting to Reynolds in time to save him. Shelton and his cellmate, who had threatened to hurt him if he refused to share, eat the steak dinner together. 
Shelton then murders him by using the steak T-bone as a knife. He is sent to solitary confinement. Rice's assistant, Sarah Lowell, finds evidence of contract payments to Shelton from the Department of Defense, so the head DA Jonas Cantrell takes Rice to meet a CIA operative who worked with Shelton. They learn Shelton was once a CIA brain working in a black ops think tank on unconventional methods of killing targets. Bray tells them to assume that he can see them and hear them at all times, he is always watching. He also warns them that he's only in jail because he wants to be in jail, and that each thing he does has a deeper meaning. When Rice asks how they should deal with Shelton, Bray advises them to walk into his cell and put a bullet in his head, otherwise they cannot stop him. As he leaves he says, if Clyde wants you dead, you're dead. Rice and Cantrell convince Judge Birch to violate Shelton's civil rights and restrict his visiting privileges. Minutes later, Judge Birch answers a cell phone which explodes, killing her instantly. At the prison, Rice confronts Shelton, who says these killings are not about revenge but about the failure of the justice system. Unless he is released with all charges dropped by 6 a.m. tomorrow, he will kill everyone. Members of the DA staff congregate until 6 a.m. They are sent home, but bombs planted underneath their cars go off and kill those inside, including Sarah. Shelton was still incarcerated, so Rice assumes he is using an accomplice outside to help. At Sarah's funeral, an unseen man wearing black clothing powers up a remote-controlled drone armed with a rocket launcher and a .5 caliber machine gun. The gun kills Cantrell as he is riding an SUV with security detail. Rice is appointed acting district attorney by the uptight mayor whom is angry at Rice for his failure to protect everyone. While looking for evidence that Shelton may have accomplices working for him, Rice receives information that points to Shelton owning a small disused garage next to the prison. Rice and Detective Dunnigan arrive at the garage and while looking around, they find a tunnel system leading to all the solitary confinement cells, along with a large supply of armaments. Apparently over the past 10 years, Shelton had dug the tunnel system from his garage to the prison and when it was finished, he deliberately had himself arrested and sent to solitary confinement in order to sneak out of the prison to carry out his killings undetected and all by himself, and then sneak back into his cell the very next day. Dunnigan opens a small hole and finds that it leads to Shelton's cell, which is empty. Disguised as a janitor, Shelton plants a cell phone activated napalm bomb in City Hall, planning to kill the mayor and anyone attending her meeting. Rice. Dunnigan and Detective Garza infiltrate the fifth floor and find the bomb directly under the sixth floor, where the mayor is situated at a security meeting. Garza attempts to disarm the bomb, but is unsuccessful and warns them to leave it alone. The three men then decide not to tell the mayor what is going on, as Shelton will be watching and will detonate the bomb with any sign of detection. They then decide what to do with the bomb. Upon returning to his cell through the underground tunnel, Shelton discovers Rice there waiting for him. Shelton offers one last deal. But Rice says that he no longer makes deals with murderers, which Shelton appreciates. Rice says to Shelton that if he detonates the bomb, it's a decision you'll have to live with for the rest of your life. With his wife and daughter long dead and feeling that he has nothing to live for anymore, Shelton decides to detonate the napalm bomb anyway, but as Rice exits and locks the cell, he calmly says, like I said, it's a decision you'll have to live with for the rest of your life, which I think now is about 25 seconds. He then begins to flee the building. At the same time, Detective Dunnigan seals the hatch in the back of the cell to ensure Shelton doesn't escape. Shelton realizes that the bomb was placed under his cot, but merely smiles and stares thoughtfully at a bracelet his daughter had made for him which says Daddy. The cell explodes, with the last shot of Shelton alive being of him looking up with an almost satisfied expression. In the final scene, Rice is seen attending his own daughter's music recital, an event he had previously put off due to work. He rises with the crowd as they cheer her on after the performance. The end. Thanks for watching.